All right. Well, we're going to get started. And uh, if you're joining us online, it's awesome. Just so you know, you're outnumbering the in-house attendance. And I think there's 60 or 50 of you online, and there's supposed to be about 25 or 28 in here. And they're not all here yet, but we need to get started. They'll, we'll take good notes for them. But thank you for joining us. It's our, it's our second seminar, our second workshop on parenting. And th this one is obviously has a tech and a social media uh, topic to it. So we're excited about doing this. We have Dr. Rob Meter with us. And I'll introduce him in a minute. And, uh, but before that, there's a few things I want to do. First of all, I'll just remind you about our church's vision. And our vision, <laughs> vision is to strengthen families towards a transformed community. And if we can strengthen families, build them up, um, in small ways, like a building block, the way you would build up a leg, well, that influences not only your family, but our communities that you influence every day as, as, as members or, or as people of our community. So that's why we're excited about this series. And uh, if you're going to our church or wondering what we're doing uh, at, at, around Christmas time, make sure you check out faithmuskoka.ca slash Christmas, and there's a whole list of things uh, that you'll uh, want to see that's going on. For example, we're doing uh, outdoor Christmas Eve services. You'll want to see information for that. And uh, so that might be new to some of you just hearing or sitting here for the first time. But also Jingle Jam is next week. And that's a, a, family, a family event. Um, we can only take 50 people in here. And so you'll want to sign up for that on December the 3rd. It starts at 6.30 next Thursday night. So you can find the link to that at that website that I just gave you at Faith Muskoka dot ca slash christmas so let me introduce dr rob so dr uh, dr rob is a uh, pediatrician he's a dad uh he go, attends a uh, connexus church in orillia but he works at uh, waypoint center in orillia and he's the director of family child and youth mental health there and so he is uh he's knowledgeable in this area and i can't wait to hear what he has to say and i'll turn it over to you now dr rob all right Good, and I'll just take this off. That makes talking a lot easier. Bill said I could do that up here. All right, good. And you almost got it right, Bill. It's actually uh, Waypoints in Midland. <laughs> or actually, it's in Panatanguachine, but that's too hard to say. So, well, thanks for having me, and thanks for making the time to come out today. Uh, my name is Rob Meter. And uh, I'm, I'm first and foremost a dad and a husband. I live in Aurelia and have been there for 17 years now. And uh, I started out working at the hospital there doing all the pediatrics that you can think of, with resuscitating newborns and asthma and diabetes. And then about five years ago, we had such a need for the mental health area. And I thought, yeah, you know, that, that's, I, I think I can do that. And, uh, and then over the last uh, five years, it's just become a real passion of mine, especially now. We are in a, in a strange, strange time uh, with regards to technology. I, my first introduction to technology was like in the late 70s. I, I was a game called Pong. And you know, there was like, bleep, 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 bleep. All right, that's good. And there was, uh, there was the doubles, which was bleep, 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 same thing. And then there was soccer, which was four bars on each side. That was soccer. Same idea, bleep, 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 bleep. So, and there was no fights, and there was no addiction to Pong at that point, as far as I can recall. And then when uh, we moved to Canada a few years later, we got a Coleco Atom with a daisy wheel printer. And uh, we got a game called Donkey Kong, which was very addictive. Played that for hours. And then my first year of university, I almost uh, failed out because I got addicted to Tetris and uh, played that for hours on end. That was sort of the digital equivalent of the Rubik's Cube, which was uh, competing at that time for kids' interests. So, and ever since that time, of course, it's just gone like that. And, but, you know, it kind of went like this. And then 2006, it went like that. And I don't know if, uh, well, let me just get to that. Uh, but this talk today um, is, I think it's going to scare you initially. And then I'm going to do a sidetrack to like the best parenting advice ever. You may, most of you already know it and you're probably already doing it. And then, we'll, and then at the end, we'll hopefully leave you with some hope uh, before Christmas. 
So, that, so that's my goal today. We, we'll probably get lots of sidetracks, like a Christmas tree type thing, on our way to our final destination. I tend, to, I tend to talk too much. I always think, oh, this talk's going to be 30 minutes, and then I'm up here an hour and a half later. Bill said I have two hours or so. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. That's good. He also said, throw a Bible verse in there. So I did. You'll see it later. Uh, just to keep it. We're out of church, right? So that's good. So what's, what's the problem? Well, you know, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, a year ago, I was at an ADHD conference and everybody's talking about how the makers of Fortnite were being sued, a class action lawsuit in, in uh, Quebec, uh, by parents whose kids had gotten addicted to Fortnite. And um, that was before COVID, that was um, before many things and before the world kind of changed. Minecraft, you know, Minecraft is the never ending creative game. We almost consider it educational at this point. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it has no end to it. You can keep playing it endlessly. And, uh, and of all the games, it's actually probably the most benign one. But my son loves Minecraft. We delayed getting Minecraft for years and years, and I thought we turned a corner. And he's like, Dad, everybody has Minecraft. All the kids are playing it. It's like, all right, well, let's just see how it goes. And there's never see how it goes. And walking back, okay? As always, you're committed. Once you've made the step, once you've given your kids that app, it's not like you're going to delete it, or once you've given them a smartphone, it's pretty hard to take back. So just remember that as you make decisions, and I'll, I'll give you a little pointer towards the end when I give some practical advice about technology. And then COVID hit, and so we knew technology was a huge issue uh, last year when I was at that ADHD conference, for example. And we knew there was kids uh, playing video games and spending too much time on social media. Uh, we had already seen a connection to, so, to, to mental health issues, which I'll highlight in a second. Um, and, then, and then COVID hit, and we ended up... Um, we knew what screen time was before, and then screen time became everything. Right? So kids were learning online, they were communicating online, they were Skyping grandparents online, uh, everything, everything moved online. And this concept of like, you know, yes, there's your life and then there's the screen time life became completely blurred and became one big package. Everything became screen time. And some of it was good. It allowed us to survive. It allowed us to get through quarantine and through lockdowns. It allowed us to keep in touch. It became our social support network to be online and to, to so this is my daughter. This is her doing uh, school. This was school for three months, right? March, April, May, June, this was school. And so uh, that was the, the, we call the COVID-19 classroom. And there she is on Google Meet. It was, schools were thrown into this. Nobody was ready for it. Um, it was not e-learning. It was not homeschooling. It was remote learning. And it was not the same as either of those. Homeschooling is way more flexible and adaptable. You can take all, advantage of all the benefits of homeschooling when you're doing homeschooling. When you're doing remote learning, you have to follow that school curriculum and you have to follow the schedule. And there's no flexibility, and or at least not much. It's tough. It's very hard. It's not, it's not what we, any of us signed up for, and yet it's what many of our kids are doing. And then those that are going to school, um, you know, it's a different experience. So our world has changed and the lines have blurred. And I think it's important now to, uh, to identify that there's digital vegetables, which kids never really want to do, at least not until you tell them to do it. And then there's digital candy. That's the video games and the mindless chatter on social media. I'm not sure if you ever watched, you know, your kids' social media feeds. So I have two teenagers, 13 and uh, sorry, 14 and 15, and I have two preteens, 11 and 12. So the, I don't know if you ever watched their like little text conversations. It's like a hundred like single emojis, like, you know, down like just like, love you, love you too, love you, yeah, you're great, awesome, you're so cute, it's amazing, that's lovely. Like that's, it's like, what are, how long, and it just keeps scrolling, it's like it just goes on and on and on. It's like, oh, you got a hundred comments on that Instagram post. Oh, but it's all like heart, 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 by the same person. That's 10 posts right there. All right, it doesn't count, all right? 
So that's digital candy. That's like, you know, kind of mindless entertainment. That's what I used to do with Tetris, and that's what Donkey Kong was, and Super Mario, and all that stuff, and Fortnite, and Minecraft. That's the digital candy, but there's the digital vegetables, which is, you know, keeping in touch with your relatives. It's the online e-learning. It's, it's schooling. It's all the stuff that's part of our lives now. So I think it's important to distinguish that. And that's a concept by Arlene Pelican, who actually wrote that book. Uh, and so she, she talks about digital vegetables and digital candy. Is, is technology, is it, is it dangerous? Well, the people who invented it sure thought it was. All right, so who's that up there? Yeah, Steve Jobs. I think it actually says Steve Jobs. Yeah, Mr. Jobs. Uh, yeah, Steve Jobs, all right. Of course, he has passed away now. He says, so your kids must love the iPad. I asked Mr. Jobs, trying to change the subject. The company's first tablet was just hitting the shelves. So this was back in 2014, I guess. Seems recent. He says, they haven't used it, he told me. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. He was very well aware of how the, the power that his company had unleashed with the tablets and the smartphones. Um, Tony Fidel, one of the men and uh, the leaders behind the iPad, introducing the iPad. I wake up in cold sweats every so often thinking, what did we bring to the world? Right? Nobody really could, would have predicted where we were today. Nobody, uh, I think they had an inkling, those that were deep inside the, sort of the creation of, these, of this technology. Uh, but how it's being used now, I'm not sure if anybody's seen The Social Dilemma, uh, a Netflix documentary. It's like, whoa, that's kind of scary. I mean, the one criticism is that, you know, it seems like there's a human being behind all this sort of, you know, nefarious mind brainwashing that's going on sort of uh, in our social media engines. Uh, but it's actually just, it's a mindless artificial intelligence that mines your data and, and feeds you what you want and puts you into social bubbles and polarizes groups and people uh, to the point where it's like, what is even true anymore? You don't know. You can't tell. Computers are generating messages and conversations and images that look real. And like, what's real and what's not? Truth, you know, used to be pretty objective and you used, we used to have, know what was true and what wasn't true. It's pretty tough right now. So imagine our kids navigating this kind of world. We are now seeing the first kids that have grown up completely with social media Right? So, 2006, that's when the first iPhone came out. And uh, I remember seeing it, I thought, wow, that is so fantastic, you know, touch, touch screen, right? You can, you can, it was fun going like this and seeing it keep going. <laughs> that was so unique. That was way better than the Palm Pilot that I had. Uh, then we remember having a Palm Pilot, you know, with a stylus and everything. And it's like, got the, ooh, you got the color Palm Pilot, wow, that's amazing. So I had the Palm Pilot, and uh, I, would, I would use that and sort of, you know, look up, um, you know, contacts, my friend's addresses, and it was so powerful. Um, but then, of course, I saw the, the touch screens, and from then on, of course, you know, it became swiping, and you could navigate through apps and the App Store. Woohoo! it was so amazing. And it just went from there. And that's, of course, when social media... Remember the first time you, you, somebody showed you texting? Does anybody remember that? My first thought was like, who would use that? <laughs> Seriously? I'm going to be doing this? Okay. I had no idea. Somebody did. And, of course, now I text all the time. I'm actually pretty good at it. I'm probably better with my thumbs than I am with my fingers. But it's intuitive, right? Kids can understand it, and they grow up with it now. And it's like, you don't need to teach them how to use an iPad or a smartphone. It's intuitive. But what's happening with mental health? This is an area, of course, that I'm interested in. I, I see literally hundreds of kids and sit with hundreds of families uh, over the days and months. And look at the numbers here. In 2013, about 24% of teenagers report moderate to serious mental distress. In 2017, that was 40%. That's a significant jump. And I would say that in 2020, with COVID, that's probably taken a similar leap again. Uh, we are seeing huge, huge mental health issues right now in teenagers. If you think about it, in, in all these 
kids, we've increased expectations and restrictions, um, you know, uh, minimized social supports, sports, extracurricular activities. I know it's for a reason. I understand. I, I am all, you know, for like we have to like get together and try to, you know, stop the virus, stop coronavirus. Um, but it's been at a cost. You know, it has been at a cost. And I, I was definitely hoping that schools would reopen in September, and thankfully they did, and they've stayed open. And right now, that appears to have been the right decision for many kids, all right? At least they get to go to school, and some sense of normalcy has been returned. And I hope it stays that way, and I hope we manage to ride out this second wave, and then I hope next year the end's in sight. My kids go to Pioneer every year in Minioe, and I just, I, I, I literally cried with my kids. It almost, I get emotional about it. They did not go this year. And um, they missed out on, on some leadership opportunities. It's taken a chunk out of their lives that uh, they'll never have back. And so I hope next year will be different. Um, and I, I, I think it will be. <laughs> it's got to be better than it was now. Um, to, between 2009 and 2014, Admissions to hospital for intentional self-harm increased by 110% in Canadian girls. Right? Where, where, did those, where did those ideas get promoted and, and, and brought to the forefront? Social media. Hospitalization for suicidal ideation and attempts amongst children doubled between 2008 and 2015. Right? These are staggering statistics. We've never seen such an explosive growth in mental health problems that we have in the last 10 years. And suicide is now the second leading cause of death in Canadian youth, all right? It's after car accidents, I believe, is the first, is the leading cause of death. It never was, it was, there was illnesses and, 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 and such before that. Now it's the second leading cause of death among, and I'm sure we all know someone who has, um, who has um, died by suicide. So, that, that's why this was happening already before COVID, and now it's, it's even more. And that's, that's, that's all since 2006. You know, we've seen, at the same time, we've seen social media and screen time use increase dramatically. Now, that could be coincidence, right? right? So, just because there's an association there doesn't mean there's causation there, right? We have to always be careful that we don't necessarily link two coincident trends together. That's not always true. But when you look at the details and how things are intermeshed and sort of dose dependence, so the more social media, the more mental health and how it actually goes up together, the evidence shows that social media and technology use actually plays a huge part. All right, if not the biggest part in driving this mental health crisis. So over the past six years, the number of teenagers with smartphones has doubled. I think pretty well, almost every teenager, almost, I, I think it's gotta be over 90%. I know there still are some teenagers out there that don't have smartphones. Um, I don't see any flip phones anymore, to be quite honest, but I think most teenagers, the vast majority now would have a smartphone. Um, in 2012, 33% used social media multiple times per day. Uh, in 2018, that was 70%. I think in 2020, it's probably 90%. Um, heavy use, which is defined as more than five hours per day, doubled between 2013 and 2017. And in the United Kingdom, the studies show that over half, 51% of infants, 6 to 11 months, use a touch screen daily. So. If infants can use it, <laughs> then, then we can too. And the interesting thing, of course, is that adults, these trends are also happening, right? We are all, all more connected and more on smartphones. And again, technology can be good. It can be used for good. Like there's so many good things that have come through technology. We're, we are in ways more connected than ever, but also, ironically, more isolated than ever. And it's almost like being connected online has allowed us to be more disconnected in so many other ways. Uh, it doesn't make up for it. Kids are losing their abilities to have conversations. And they're losing their abilities to connect, uh, to sit for a job interview face to face with someone, right? To have a meaningful conversation, to greet someone, to, to look them in the eye. 
because we're just constantly just doing this instead. So those skills, we need to be more intentional about. We need to see that return because it's just so important. Our human beings, our brains are meant to socially engage, not online, but in person. So it's funny that, you know, you look at the studies and talking to teenagers and it's all about how much teenagers use Facebook. I don't know a single teenager that uses Facebook, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, teenagers don't use Facebook, they use TikTok. All right, everybody familiar with TikTok? Right, so if you see a teenager on the street going like this, that's TikTok, they're doing the TikTok dance. Their phone is standing over there on some kind of ledge. Um, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't know, that's good. There's a, a Snapchat, all right, so Snapchat. I was warned about Snapchat, okay? I, it's, it, it's, I'm sure you all know about Snapchat now, it's an instant messaging platform, but the messages kind of disappear after you send them. It has location features, so you can kind of see where all your friends are, and who knows who else can see where you are. So, um, that's, that's the big one. So it's not like texting, it's a little bit more savvy, all right? So if you have an agreement with your, with your child that you can check their phone at any time, you may not see all their Snapchat messages. Um, and then Instagram, Instagram is probably another big one. There's probably more out there. You know, this, is, this will be out of date probably in about two years, or maybe in a year. Uh, maybe it's outdated already and I'm just behind the times. But those are kind of the three main platforms. It's not really Facebook anymore. I mean, not, none of my kids, I don't think, are ever really on Facebook. But amongst adults, it's still the common platform. And uh, it's funny to see all the studies that talk about teenagers using Facebook. And I'm reading that going like, oh, that was like 10 years ago. Um, good podcast on this, Colin Karchin. Anybody listen to his podcast before? Uh, unfortunately, he passed away last month. Young guy, 40 years of age, unexpected. Some medical condition. He... I actually was speaking to him about doing a podcast interview um, and then I was about to get back to him and unfortunately he was in Utah, he passed away. So sad story. But if you want to be scared about social media, this is the scare you part of the talk, listen to one of his episodes. Um, he's all about, you know, online trolling, you know, viral bullying. Um, Pedophiles love TikTok, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of posing as different people and creating identities and false accounts. Um, so he was all into exposing that and, and really getting parents to reconsider whether to even have, let your child have a smartphone. So questions you might have, does social media affect the sense of self? Yeah, it does for sure. We see self-confidence and self-esteem decrease the more that social media is being used. Does social media addiction exist and can it affect mental health? Yes, all right? It's hard, there's, a, there's no hard and fast definition of what addiction actually is. But when you do brain scans and you look at functional MRI, <clears throat> when kids are playing video games, the same centers are hit as when they're doing drugs. All right, it's that same addictive quality. There's like unpredictable rewards. It's never ending. You know, it's like the casino, it's like the slot machine, right? You just never know. It's very fast paced, very addictive. Can social media promote self-harm? Yes, there's many, many, many examples of sites where self-harm is promoted and glorified, um, where you are even encouraged and, and, and told that this is a good way to get, you know, to, to express your emotions. And it's very troubling because many kids go to these sites and there can be very supportive, supportive connectors online as well. And then you get this thrown in there and it just can very quickly lead down a very negative rabbit hole. And do the effects of smartphones uh, uh, on social skills affect mental health? Do, Yes, yes, smartphones do. Yes, we know, we just talked about this already, but definitely increased rates of depression and anxiety the more kids are on smartphones. Heavy users, five hours or more, definitely we see very robust trends upward of depression and anxiety. Sleep loss is probably one of the biggest issues 
with screens. All right, so a lot of kids are on screens before bedtime. Um, when they're supposed to be asleep, sometimes we think, okay, this will help you fall asleep. Used to be TVs, all right? Used to be TVs in the bedroom. And for years and years, I would say, like, don't put TV in the bedroom, don't put TV in the bedroom. And it was easy, just didn't put a TV in the bedroom. But these devices are so portable, you know, it's so easy to bring in bed with you. It's so easy to be under the covers with, you know, a tablet and watching YouTube, cat videos, you know, and being on your Minecraft and just playing endlessly because it just never ends. You know, it used to be a video game was over. It's like, oh, okay, one more game, and game over. Okay, put it away. Most of these games, they never end. Levels are infinite. So, um, so it's a big issue. And sleep is very disrupted, okay? We know the bright light, even the blue light feature, I mean, they're still pretty bright. Melatonin production goes down. Circadian rhythm is disrupted. And whereas we think that, okay, just watch a movie to help you fall asleep, every study shows that watching videos or watching something online actually keeps you awake. And then notifications, buzz, 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 right? If that's beside your bed. I mean, as I'm sure as adults, we've seen it too. You know, your, your phone goes off, it's like, oh, what is that? Oh, that's so-and-so trying to get a hold of me. And in our age now, where we're expected to be ever connected, we pick it up and we re-answer. So... It's funny about television because, you know, it used, used to be that, oh, okay, um, you know, television, don't watch television. Now, now it's like I almost promote family television time as like family time, you know. <laughs> it's like 20 years ago, it was like, don't ever watch TV. Now it's like, ah, oh, it's good family time. Watch a TV show together. It's so much better. So 20 years from now, we were like, oh, man, you should, you know, disconnect from the matrix. You should try social media sometime. So now what? Well, a couple of basics, and then I'm going to go take that sidetrack to the best parenting advice ever. I know I'm getting you all set up for something amazing. Don't worry. It's, it's pretty good. But anyways, the basics. So introduce technology as late as possible. Don't feel like you need to be in a rush to get your kids on iPhone because they might miss out about how do I use an iPhone or how do I use an iPad. Uh, 11, to 15, you know, 11 months old, use it in the United Kingdom. All right? Don't worry. They'll get it. All right? There's very few reasons why you need to introduce, you know, technology early. In fact, there's no reasons. In fact, the Canadian Pediatric Society says there's no reason why any child should have screen time before the age of four. All right? There is a big discussion and controversy in the Canadian Pediatric Society about things like baby Einstein, okay, because there was claims there that it was actually educational. It, does not, it not, does not promote education, all right? It does not enhance reading. There's a little bit of evidence for Sesame Street to help promote early literacy, all right? It definitely in certain populations, it's better than not watching it, but it's very limited. No kid's going to fall behind because you withheld screen time from them. Now, I know it's okay to be reasonable. Like, if, if, if you are doing something, you're busy, and the kid watches a show, that's not the end of the world. Just saying anything in excess, just be careful, right? So don't use it as an excuse going like, well, that's educational. That's not educational. Well, it's, it doesn't make a difference, all right? It's, it's digital candy. For young kids, digital candy. This is what you'll get when your kids grow up. They're like, well, everybody else has a phone. Everybody else has one. Or like we, and I felt trapped to that. It's like everybody in your class, a smartphone, and then it was... The teacher is asking us to bring our devices to school because we need to use it for our homework assignment. Like, what? Now I have to get you a phone in order to like, do the schoolwork? What's going on here? And it's true. Like, kids are bringing their phones to school, and uh, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it um, because I, I think it's very distracting. And I think, again, you know, if you need to use a calculator, get a calculator. Um, if you need to use it to check the time, get a watch, all right? There's no reason why we need to have smartphones that are constantly connected to the internet. So introduce technology as late as possible. Uh, really, you know, what, what age? There's no magic age, but certainly I would say before kids go off to high school, there's really not a lot of compelling evidence that a child needs to have a smartphone. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of options. Either it's a smartphone or it's nothing. There's not a lot of options out there. I don't know if you've ever gone to like the Rogers store. It's like just smartphones. 
So use simple screen time settings on your smartphone. So if you've got like a family, use that family sharing package like Apple products have. And on there, you can control exactly how much time the child spends on their phone. So we have, I have limits set for all my kids, even my 15-year-old, about how many hours per day. Um, it's going to be different for every family. I'm sure somebody's going to ask me, how many hours a day is it? All right, well, it's, it's different for every kid, but it should, be, it should be reasonable. And if they want more time, be flexible. You know, allow, allow them to ask for more time. You can approve or not approve it. Uh, every app that my, one of my kids wants to download, I get a little message on my phone that says, you know, so-and-so wants to download Mission Impossible 5 or whatever. It's like, okay, I check, check it out. I see what the age rating is. I look a little bit on a little preview and make sure it's appropriate. And if it's good, then maybe I allow it. And if not, then we just say disapprove, right? Or I don't think it says disapprove. I think it says don't approve or something like that. Anyway, so use, use, that, use those settings. There are other programs out there too. There's other devices out there too. I think there's like Disney Circle. Um, I'm sure Google has something equivalent. I'm not sure what it's called. But there are solutions out there for families to control the kids' devices. And you just got to set it up. You guys got to take the time to do it. Um, use desktop computers in homes, open areas. So laptops being carted all around the house in the kids' bedrooms, you know. Just put like a desktop in the kitchen area or on a desk in the living room or something like that. And that's where kids can use it. That way, you know, you're always just around. You can check over their shoulder. That should be permissible. Not like you're hovering over your kid all the time. But just when it's in an open area, the use tends to be just more benign. Uh, phones charge in the kitchen overnight. So in our house, it's, it's a rule. No phones in the bedroom at night. So that means when you go to bed, first of all, you know, phones off an hour before bedtime. Try to enforce that as much as possible. And then phones charge up in the kitchen. That's where we have a bunch of chargers, and they can charge your phones there. Turn off all notifications. I think this is so important. Um, you know, that's what's so disruptive and so distracting. I went through, I don't know, a year ago, and I just said, I turned off all these notifications. I think I just have like one message that still come through, I think from my wife, because I couldn't turn her off. And, uh, and, and, and just, but literally I just, everything was getting coming on your phone. You're like, oh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Or you feel it buzzing in your pocket. That's not my phone, that's actually the microphone. But, oh, there it is right there. But, you know, you don't want that thing lighting up all the time. It's so disruptive and so distracting. Um, and get a watch or alarm clock. So many families say, like, well, I, it's my alarm. Okay, well, just get an alarm clock. Remember, we used to, alarm clock used to be great. Remember that? It was a good old days when alarm clocks did just fine and you woke up to, you know, the nice sounds of CBC News. Um, you know, or get a watch. They've shown that if you wear a watch, the amount of times you pick up your phone decreases dramatically. And then make all your child's social media accounts private, all right? Try to, try to keep an eye on that and just make sure that, um, that, that they control who actually can see them and follow them. And, and really try to teach your kids that, hey, listen, this is, this is going to you know, protect you. And it's important to guard your privacy. You know, when we make hires at Waypoint, one of the first things we do is we see what's happening on social media. With that, with that employee or that potential candidate. You know, you wanna vet them that way and check them out that way. And I think our kids are gonna be in for a surprise when they show up for a job interview or a university interview and realize all my social media out there is there. And uh, we gotta be careful what we post. So that message, it, to a teenager that doesn't really sink in or a preteen for sure, we have to teach that. We have to be intentional about that. And we have to watch that ourselves, too. But the kicker is that all of these things, which are good for your kids, same rules for parents. I think it's so hard to try and enforce certain principles and to, to bring them across if we, as parents, are like, yeah, but you know, I still get to do this and I still get to do that. And you may have perfectly valid reason. You may have said, well, it's for my work, you know, and I'm checking email or I'm reading the news, you know. Just check yourselves too. And because and, and, I've seen many parents, even at doctor's offices, who quickly have to, you know, check their phone while they're talking to me sometimes. Um, 
uh, and while I'm you know, doing the kids height and weight or something. And we ourselves can be very addicted to our phones as well. And I think anything you try to bring forward, bring it forward as a family. Say like, I'm gonna work on this too. And none of us are perfect, I'm not perfect. I mean, I look at my screen time use over the course of a week, I'm like, ooh, that's higher than my kids. And I might excuse it and say like, well, you know, I was using it for work and I was looking up useful stuff, but a lot of times it's just checking certain websites or checking some statistics or checking the weather or doing too much emailing. It's just so there, it's just so ever present. And I have to check myself. And um, so I, I think it's just important that we try and put these rules together as a family. So if you wanna, if you wanna look at some guidelines and some principles, do it as a family. There's a verse. Bill, this is the Bible verse for you. Jesus charged him saying, television to no man. If you say it fast, you'll get it. It's actually in the Bible, television to no man. So Jesus banned screen time. It's such a dad joke, I know, it's so terrible. Okay, so, um, so, so all we're, what we're talking about here is really like screen time expectations, right? So expectations in general. And this is kind of where like the little parenting thing comes in. Um, because if people always ask me and they're like, well, how can we get our kids to like, you know, do this or that? Or like, or the worst thing is when people bring them to my office and say like, Tell him he can't smoke marijuana anymore. All right, can't smoke marijuana anymore. Doesn't work, right? Because I have no relationship with them. And, and, and it's like, oh, you know, you got to have a relationship with your kids before you can actually, you know, have influence. And so there's all these expectations that we have for our kids, right? We want our kids to do this or to do that, to be home at a certain time, to go to bed at a certain time, to spend this much time on, on Minecraft or to use their phones this much uh, to make their beds in the morning. And if your kids are meeting expectations, fantastic, right? If your kids are doing what you're expecting them to do, just, there's, it's just heaven on earth, right? Of course, that never happens because if they're not meeting certain expectations, then what do you do? And this is what I love. I love the collaborative problem-solving approach or collaborative and practice solutions. Some of you may know about this. It's taught to many teachers and it's taught in parenting courses. I love, uh, I love that approach. Uh, popularized, I think, by Dr. Ross Green. Um, so he's episode one on my podcast, Smart Family Podcast. So there, yeah, a little plug. Bill said I could put a little plug in for the podcast. So there you go. So Ross Green wrote all about it in The Explosive Child, the idea of create or collaborative and proactive solutions. That's what he calls it, or collaborative problem solving. And I think that's the best way to ha have your child meet expectations, not just for older kids. This starts right at baby age, all right? Because you are constantly trying to figure out what does my child need from me? And they're constantly figuring out like, what, what do I need from you? That's called attunement. That happens with mother and baby happens when there's eye contact, when there's connection established, you know, we are attuning to our kids and that, and when you're a toddler, it's different, you become verbal, you're able to express yourself better, and as you get older, you know, we start to use much more of our higher cognitive abilities to express our needs and our desires. And so, it's important to collaborate with your child to solve problems, to figure out what they need and what, 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 what you need what your expectations are, what their expectations are, and then coming up with a collaborative solution. So Ross Green is good. He kind of puts it into like three different types of parenting. There's plan A. So let's say your child's not meeting expectations. So plan A is, this is the rule, and you know, you better follow it, right? That's, so that's kind of like power sort of dynamic. Um, at unilateral. All right, so kind of like, no, nope, I'm, I'm the parent and you're the kid. And you know, sometimes you have to do that. Sometimes it's, that makes the most sense at the time. And many of us grew up that way, I did. You know, it's sort of like, this is the rules, follow them you know, while you're under this house, under this roof. You know, I've heard that lecture many times from my dad. And, uh, and you know, 
it does work for, for many kids. You kind of feel like, okay, you better follow the rules, and that's what the rules are, and that's what the expectations are. Um, that's plan A. Plan C is, well, these are the rules, but we're not going to enforce it now. We're going to put it off till later. Or we're going to talk about it later because we're in a store. Or it's, you know, I'm driving a car and it's a snowstorm and I don't really want to talk about it right now. So we're going to put it off till later. That's plan C. But plan B is what we call solving the problem together proactively, which means before the blow up, ideally, and collaboratively. All right? Proactively can also mean after the situation has calmed down. So we've had an unmet expectation. We've identified some lagging skills and some lagging, you know, some difficulties. Uh, it's, now it's de-escalated. Now let's solve this problem for next time. Let's see what led to that. What is the actual unmet expectation that we're having trouble meeting? So the problem with plan A is that unilaterally imposed solutions almost never stick. Work for a while, but then you're constantly like, you know, enforcing, enforcing, enforcing. It's not a great collaborative relationship that you want your kids to have. And in the end, I mean, that's how you want your kids to grow up, to be able to work in a collaborative way with their colleagues and with their partners and with their kids eventually. Um, and we, uh, we wish we could see more of this in politics and in leadership, uh, working collaboratively. So it's, with, it's a skill we want our kids to have, so why not start when they're actually under our roof? So here's the steps to plan B. Plan B parenting, so how to make kids meet expectations. And then screen time expectations is a specific example of that. But in general, first start, listen with empathy. This will shock a lot of kids, like, oh, you actually want to know what I'm thinking? Okay. So listen to their kind of like, what's the problem? What, 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 is, what is my perspective on this? Like, how, how, what, what do I think about this? All right? And then the second one is, define the problem. So you as an adult step in and say like, well, listen, this is, these are my expectations. This is what I think. And then the third step is to invite solutions. So, all right, you don't want to do your math tonight. Okay, well, you don't want to do your math because you want to, you want to call your friends or you think it's too hard. Uh, and then I say, well, I think you should do math so to, to find a problem because, you know, it's important to learn fractions and because tomorrow you won't have time to do it and because your teacher expects it to be done and you've got that test coming up at the end of the week, right? And then you brainstorm solutions. So the kid will say, well, how, maybe I'll just do it all tomorrow instead of tonight. And you'll be like, well, that's not really realistic because tomorrow you've got like youth group. Right, okay. So after some back and forth, you'd be surprised how many times you can come up with a mutually satisfactory and realistic solution that you can then put in place and then step four, reassess and reevaluate down the line. Now this sounds amazing, I know. It's like, that never happens in real life. It does happen, it does happen. You do it actually all the time right now. You maybe don't even realize all the steps that you're taking. But if, you're, if you have a, a good, like, edifying relationship, this is happening all the time, even organically. And it maybe we're just putting some words around it. But if you find that every expectation is a power struggle at home, try this. Just try it for a few times. And it may take some getting used to. It's like, oh, no, I don't want to be a pushover. I don't want to, like, you know, feel like my kid's got, you know, control over the situation and I don't. It's like, well, no, look at it differently. Look at it that you're both sitting on the same side of the table, looking at the same problem, and you're solving it together. Right, this is very well-studied negotiations type science from the Harvard Negotiations Product. They wrote that classic book called Getting to Yes. I'm not sure most leaders would have read it, but how to come to a, a good solution. This is basically the family version of Getting to Yes. All right? Ross Green was from Harvard. All right? I'm not surprised. I bet you they all collaborated one night while they were having a beer or something. So this is basically the family model of how to come to a collaborative and proactive solution. And don't do it in the heat of the moment, all right? Do it when everybody's calm, when you've got time to do it. If you don't have time to do it, if you don't think you can do it, then use plan C. Put it off till later and then do it, all right? But try to use plan B as much as possible. If you want to know more about this, get the explosive child. I think I had a copy of it here. Actually, I think it's in the room down there. 
uh, and any of Ross Green's books, and, and, it's, and his website, livesinabalance.org, great website that explains all this free parent resources. And like I said, this is being used in many schools, all right, because oftentimes classrooms can be very plan A, it's like this is what the expectation is, you know, this is what you do. Um, and we see a lot of kids having meltdowns and fits and running out of the classroom because our expectations are here and their abilities are here and we need to come to some kind of proactive and creative solution. So that's collaborative problem solving. So to summarize, identify the unsolved problem, what are the lagging skills, and then use plan B if you can proactively. Right? I know plan B is also something in pharmacies, but this is a different plan B. Okay, so finally, hope for the future. This is the last part. So I really hope that we can turn a corner on technology use and hopefully make parenting easier. I think we've got a whole generation of kids, like I said, that's growing up with technology. It's in their DNA now. It's in their society. And I think we're seeing more and more recognition of this. I think you're even seeing some reluctant um, admission of this by the big companies that are creating technology. I, I think it's subtle because it's still, they're still driven by the bottom line. And I would be too if I was the CEO of that company. But, you know, I think we're seeing much more social responsibility and ethical responsibility and recognition that, okay, we got to make some changes here. I think governments are cluing into this with regulatory processes and you know, recognizing that privacy is important. We're seeing many more reasonable regulations around guarding privacy and making sure that your data is not being used against you or without your permission. I think those are all steps in the right direction. Um, the fact that Apple even introduced screen time limits. I mean, they are literally putting in place measures that decrease the use of the devices that they're trying to sell. Okay. I know that makes them sell more devices because their device is better at doing that, but still, it's a step in the right direction. So I think there's going to be an increasing taboo for being always connected. We are seeing many more people at work saying, listen, I, putting it right in our email or auto-respond, I, I won't respond to work emails after 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock, right? My work day is 9 to 5. The rest of the time, family time. I think you're going to see a huge taboo about people using phones in restaurants, right? And I, I've done it already. It's sort of like you look over there, it's like that couple's been on their smartphones the whole time. Like, that doesn't seem like a nice day. Unless they're texting each other. That could be. But they're probably not. They're probably checking the menu. But, you know, so I think you can see more and more sort of a taboo against walking with your phone down the street like this um, and seeing, walking into a room and seeing everybody on cell phones. It happens now. I mean, I walked back to my university where I went in the 1990s and I went to the student union building. That used to be a hub of activity, people running around. Now it's everybody sitting there staring at their cell phones, right? So that social engagement isn't happening anymore. And I think we're starting to wake up to that. I would love to see phone-free schools. I don't see a huge reason why kids should have to bring their smartphones to school. I, don't, I know it's hard to enforce. Um, I, I think there are you know, some kids that may need to be connected for whatever reason. Maybe have to be exceptions to this. Maybe we need to you know, collaboratively solve that problem. But um, you know, I, I think the, the step should be you know, we don't need the distraction. Definitely having to be connected at all times is not necessary. Uh, I think kids will not fall behind by not having technology in the classroom when they should be learning. Um, how about some not too smart phones, right? How about if there's more options for phones for kids that maybe tell you where they are and allow them to text you, maybe make phone calls in emergency, but aren't always instantly connected to the internet and to the whole big wide world of the World Wide Web, right? I mean, you don't just throw your keys to the car to your 16 year old and say, there you go, it's all yours, right? We have graduated licensing, we have graduated sort of experience with that. Why can't it be the same way for the internet? And there are some companies, I think in the States, and maybe some of you know something, maybe in Canada as well, but I, I know in the States there are some phones and phone companies that 
offer exactly this kind of option so that you know you can give a, a phone or a device to an eight-year-old and know that you know their access is going to be only to things that are really necessary like a calculator and a flashlight and you know being able to text their parents in case of an emergency or something right I mean ultimately that's what we always tend to say we are going to use it for is that for those emergency situations but of course we know that 99 percent of the time it's being used for everything else smarter and less intrusive technology i think we'll probably see more wearable technology things that are a bit more you know hidden uh, and hopefully mesh better with our social lives and in a society with alternatives we need sports we need camps we need things for kids to do um, outside of just being on the phone all the time, right? So we need things that promote socialization. After COVID, let's, let's just commit to doing that. Uh, maybe now is not the time, but it's time to start dreaming about it. Um, and then enhance regulations for big tech, social media privacy, I mentioned that already, and this in general, having improved mental health supports. I mean, we are seeing this epidemic of mental health difficulties. We're seeing lots of kids with depression, anxiety. Um, we see the link with social media use. I mean, that's not all the time. We see this, you know, arise as well for other reasons uh, and other issues. But technology certainly can play a big part in that. It can certainly fuel a lot of anxiety. A lot of teenagers out there living for likes, all right? Making sure that so-and-so has seen their post and if they didn't, it's devastating. Keeping up Snapchat streaks for like 600 days. And we're familiar with Snapchat streaks, right? And it's like you just mindlessly send little swipe pictures to all your friends. And if you lose a streak, it's like the end of the world. And I have had some parents, you know, if the kids go to camp, the parents have been instructed, keep my streaks going. So that when I get back, I can, you know, continue on and not lose a streak. Because apparently if you don't, if you lose a streak, that means you don't care about the other person. Well, of course, that's not true. All right, so lots of, lots of kids are unfortunately very anxious, very addicted, and very um, um, troubled by, the, by this technology use. All right, that's all I had. I should have had a final thank you slide up there, but I guess I don't, so you get to see my keynote uh, desktop there. Good, thanks. Any questions? Yeah, I'll get to that in a second, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, thanks a lot. If you want to grab a drink or grab a seat, and uh, I'll just, sure. um, we've got a couple that came in from online. So I'll ask a couple of those questions. Then we'll uh, give you some time to think about it. And uh, we'll just, if you just raise a hand, I'll try and get to them as there's time. Okay, are you good to go? I'm already? good, okay. yeah. I was looking at my phone during your talk, but it was only to look at these questions, I promise. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Whatever, Bill. Yeah. You were checking your likes. <laughs> oh, it's not that good. I, well, it's great. Anyway, okay, <laughs> never mind. Uh, here's a good one from online that I thought was, uh, was good to start off. It says, thank you for a great seminar, uh, Dr. Meter. Can you talk a bit more about the impact of screen time on early development and what's the effect on social development and language development? That's like, probably more than one there. Is there a... Yeah, well, uh, so like I said, there is no educational value to screen time in young kids. And I think the question seems to be directed towards, you know, young kids and early development. The brain literally like triples in size between the ages of zero and four. It, has, it makes like literally a million connections per second. So the brain is so rapidly forming during those early years of life, which is great. It's growing. It's making all these connections. But if that happens in a positive, supportive environment, that's like huge, right? And any massive stressor or any toxic stressor that happens during early development is going to have huge ramifications down the line. And so it's so important. Those early years are just so important for healthy brain development, okay? We know there are now situations of what's called developmental trauma, where kids who are exposed to toxic stress and traumatic events in the early years of life can lead to physical and mental health problems decades down the road, okay? The, those, those connections are being made through the adverse childhood events studies, uh, adverse childhood experiences studies, sorry. Um, and those, those associations are very, very robust. So that those early years of life are just so key. Um, 
So expose kids to things that are healthy, which is face-to-face, -face, serve and return type interactions. Peekaboo, you know, you do it, I do it. Hide and go seek. You know, you do something, I do something. Copying, reading to your child, okay? Reading to them is very important. All right, you can use a Kindle for that, but reading from a book, all right? Go back to books. Reading is hugely, hugely beneficial for kids. I should have put this in there as one of the sort of things to do. Read more, read more, read more. Get kids reading. Uh, it's so important. So those early years of life are vital. There are, uh, there are some studies out there that question whether exposure to frenetic and busy cartoons can lead to things like ADHD. Uh, there are some studies that support that, and there are some studies that don't support that. You'll find some researchers, I just did an interview with Russell Barkley, who wrote a lot about ADHD, uh, and he's like, I don't believe that there is a link there. If you look at it, uh, there's Dimitri Christakis, who is in Seattle, who did a study with mice, found that when he exposed them to flashing lights when they were in early development, they all developed ADHD, all right? They couldn't complete tasks anymore. So maybe in mice it makes a difference. But we know that the exposure to lots of like boom, fast changing scenes, et cetera, and video games, et cetera, in early development can possibly affect the developing brain and lead to things like ADHD. So the jury's out there of how strong that association is, but it certainly isn't beneficial and it's potentially harmful. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I think that got most points. All right, good, yeah. Really, good. yeah, if I was writing your exam, I would say that was uh, 95%. All right, good, thanks, man. Ooh. All right, uh, one more question, then we'll turn to some to you guys. What are indicators to watch for in a child that would point to too much screen time? Okay, well, um, so if when you ask them to get off and you get a, like, whirlwind temper tantrum, that would probably be a good sign that no. <laughs> there might be some addiction going on there, right? So uh, if, 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 if your child, if you tell them, hey, listen, you know, time to get off the screen, you've been on there for a long time, and you get, like, disaster, that's a good, that's a good sign. Um, it definitely, uh, if you get more and more withdrawal, if you find that, you know, homework is not being done, they're not going out with their friends because they're online. Now, a lot of video games are actually social, right? They're on with their friends all together. So there's this, like, kind of good social part sometimes, but then it's like, but it's not being together. The quality is just different. And sometimes the games they're playing, maybe not the most, you know, educational. Let's put it that way. So I think definitely we see a lot of social skills being lost by kids who are spending too much time even socially online playing video games. And it's too much when they're not doing the things that they used to love. They're not, they're not interested in sports anymore. Um, they are not interested in spending time with the family. All right. They don't want to come down for dinner. All those things. It's like, okay, you know, that's other things in life we should be doing. And that is video games or screen time has become a priority then you know it's probably too much and it's time to like use some collaborative problem solving and say like hey how can we you know change the trajectory of this uh habit good points i may or may not have seen those in my family <laughs> <laughs> all right let's uh, oh i'm sure they're all on the bible app oh totally yes yeah and uh so we do have some more online questions but uh, are there any questions here and i'll, I'll start i saw that hand first. And if, if you want to say it, you can repeat the question sure. as you heard it. Would that will, be helpful, yeah. please? Yeah. 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 Thanks. So the question is, you know, would age limits help? And is that potentially a reason why Facebook is not as popular with 
younger kids because it has a, I think, 13 year or something age limit. Yeah, no, it's possible. First of all, my experience is that most kids find out ways to get around the age limit somehow. Like it's, there are some workarounds that their friends seem to know about and it's like, wait a second, you're not supposed to have that on your phone, but I guess you do. Um, so there, there, are some, there are some workarounds. Uh, maybe that's the reason why Facebook isn't as popular with the younger kids. I think the main reason that Facebook isn't as popular with the teenagers is because their parents are on it. They don't want the parents to follow them or to see what they're doing. So, you know, so they go on to these other types of social media platforms that they know their parents aren't on. If you're a parent, I encourage you to get what your kids are on and to like follow them, right? It's pretty interesting. Uh, but don't ever like it because if they find out that you're like stalking them, your relationship is doomed. But, you know, but I, I, I do think that having age limits, I think in the news for the first time last week, I actually saw there was some process or a, a proposal to make sure that pornography websites have some age verification type process associated with it. I thought that was interesting. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work or how it's going to be enforced. But again, it's maybe some people are thinking in the, in the right direction. I, we, I, we didn't even talk about, you know, pornography, online pornography and the problems that's causing to our teenagers, but well, that may be another talk some other day. Yeah, about part two, maybe. Pardon? Part two, Part maybe. two, part yes. Two, yeah. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but, you know, there's age limits are hard to enforce. They are relatively easy to get around. Um, and, you know, age limits may just force kids to use certain platforms that have none and parents are on other ones. No, no, and that's, that's the problem, right? The whole World Wide Web is out there. Like, as soon as you put a device in your kid's hand, like, the power of a billion computers is literally at their fingertips. Like, this never used to be like that. You used to have to go to an encyclopedia to look something up. You know, it's, it was a library, and now it's like, it's just all there, and it, it, the world has changed. And that can be good. I mean, that, I, I, having information at your fingertips is very handy sometimes. Um, but it can also just be overwhelming too, and f especially for kids to navigate that. You know, I think one of the most important skills we're gonna teach kids these days is just critical thinking. Like, how do I actually know this is reliable? How do I know this is true? You know, how do I know I can trust this? Uh, how do I know this is not a scam? Like, I am worried about my kids getting texts from, you know, somebody who wants to deposit some money into their account, they're like, oh, okay, and you know, suddenly it's a phishing scam. Like, I'm like tuned to that, like I have a radar, like that's a scam, that's a scam, that's a scam, you know, I can pick it out from, from anywhere, I think, and I could even be fooled, I'm sure, and let alone, you know, my kids. I'm, so we need to teach them about cybersecurity and digital safety and, and all that stuff and keeping your passwords protected, and this should be like 101 type course at some school somewhere. Sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about any other question on maybe this side? Yeah, I see that. Um, mm. Mm-hmm.
Okay, interesting. I just. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, because you know, I'm sure you, and so the comment is by a teacher, so thank you for your comment. Thank you for what you're doing. Social media unit in English, fantastic. I think that's so, so important. And the other thing I was going to say was the belonging Yeah. No, yeah, loss of sleep uh, is a huge, huge factor for mental health for sure and late, delayed bedtime and like I said, de delayed melatonin production and everything like that. So thanks for your comments. It, this, the comment was primarily around how few kids actually have rules in place in the general population. And I noticed too, because my kids will have sleepover sometime and I'll go down, or my wife goes down and says, okay kids, you know, phone's in the kitchen. And you, they look at you like you have nine heads. Like, what do you mean? My mom's expecting me to text me. No, your mom's not expecting you to text you at 1 a.m. You, everybody phone in the kitchen, that's the rule. And we tell our kids now too is that, yep, you can have a sleepover on your birthday or whenever. And we're not big sleepover fans to begin with, but let's, you know, come for your birthday if you have sleepover, but tell your friends the rules are the phones go upstairs at bedtime and you know, we've had, we've had one kid bail on the sleepover and ask the parents to come pick them up when the, she realized she had to give up her phone at, you know, 11 o'clock. It's like, yeah. So that's, again, goes to, goes to your point. So just even having some rules, that was your other point, just having some rules is already you're in a minority. So, um, so start simple, you know, don't, don't suddenly come home and like put all 10 rules in place and say, Dr. Meter said so. Um, first of all, I'll get all this hate mail and you know, whatever, and I'll get disliked on all my websites by these teenagers. But, um, but you know, do one thing at a time. Do manageable chunks, work on it collaboratively, you know, manage your expectations, listen to their points of view and come to a, come to a, creative solution, right? You'd be surprised how many times if the kid feels like they've helped come up with the solution, the buy-in will be huge. It's way, way more likely to stick. They will feel accountable and responsible for that decision themselves. So ultimately coming, to, that's why I love collaborative problem solving because you are coming together to a solution and the kids own it and they're part of the solution. So it works. Okay. I'll do one online question, and then I'll, I'll do one from you guys again if there's one after. Well, this one's kind of in the middle of typing. That's awesome. Technology is good, I guess. And so, okay, how do you reward good behavior, aka your kids are following the plan that you've both worked on with collabor work that you've both worked on while co collaboratively problem solving? Oh, good. Yeah. So there's a little bit of you know different trains of thought. Like, how much should you reward kids? Like you. You don't really want kids who are just performance driven, like, okay, if you do this, then you get this. Like, it should be like a relationship, right? That's ultimately what you want. You want a, a, a good, you know, you want your kids to come to you. You want your kids that when they grow up, they actually want to come back and visit you, right? That's sort of like the ultimate test. It's like, okay, I did it as a parent. My kids still want to visit me, you know, when they're in university or whatever. So, but in terms of like, you know, the small things, I think the benefits to having a good collaborative problem solving approach in your kid's relationship is that the level of like animosity and just, just goes down, right? It just starts, to, the, the, the tension is, is, is eased. And I think so many times, you know, parenting can feel like a power struggle, it's like, they're digging their heels in and you're digging your heels in and, and, and voices raise and it's just, it, it, and the tension just goes up and ratchets up and it's just not comfortable. Everybody feels tense. I think when it's collaborative problem solving, you work on this together, the reward is the tension just decreases and you just have time for other stuff. You're not fighting about everything anymore. 
So I don't think there needs, I mean, yes, you can build some rewards into like, you know, having certain achievements, and there's always time for praising your kids and saying like, hey, that's awesome, you did it, or hey, look at that, you know, this whole week, you did it. Like your screen time was average, like X number of hours per day, awesome. Like, let's go and get something. But you don't want it to make it just for the rewards. You would all, you always want the reward to be intrinsic, to come from the inside, not extrinsic, okay? You don't want your kids working for McFlurries or dollar store treats or video games, right? Because that, that's really not a great, that's more of a transactional approach to parenting and I think you want to try and avoid that. All right, we did one on online question. Let's do one from here. Is there any questions out there right now? Yes. Yeah, you were nodding a lot there. I noticed that. Not nodding off, you were nodding with, <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Working together. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, good. Yeah, no, I highly recommend it. And by the way, Ross Green's coming to do a lecture at Waypoint uh, in February. So we've, um, so it's, now it's, it's virtual because of the pandemic, but uh, he is doing a lecture with Waypoint and some teaching for family doctors too. So maybe I'll send the link to that. That'd people can, yeah. uh, people can attend, it's gonna be free. So yeah, so, and on his website, I did a webinar with him too about um, just about teaching for teachers in the pandemic. We did one in September just about and one one for parents and stuff as well. Yep. 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 Many school boards too. So that's great. I hear nice to hear that you guys are doing that too. That's fantastic. Yeah, no for sure. It's a great model. It it, it works. It's it makes sense. Uh, it's it'll it's tough to kind of like start right from scratch, but it's worth it. And like I said, you're kind of constantly doing collaborative problem solving with your young kids all the time anyways. When you're attuning to them, you're figuring out what they need, they're figuring out what you need, and, and then that just evolves into a, a more cognitive process that's plan B. So I highly recommend it. So thanks for the, thanks for the uh, words. Yeah, and that book was that you recommended, and you mentioned it was Explosive Child, right? Yeah, The Explosive Child. He's written other books too called Lost at School, which is more of a school based sort of idea, raising human beings, which is more of a bigger picture of how we all would love to be more collaborative. So I think it, uh, all those books are worth reading for sure. Okay, here's a practical question, I all think. All right, good, uh, practical, yes. I think. <laughs> I love, this person wrote, they love the idea of everyone charging their phones, devices in the kitchen, kids or no kids. How do you do it personally if your job involves you being on call um, or other people who want to lead by example but have jobs that require on call shifts? practicalities like that yeah so so there's a so first of all I am fortunate I am not on call at night so that's good cool. <laughs> no, it's, but uh, but I so I, I'm able to leave my phone downstairs we actually have a little charging drawer it's underneath one of our computer desks and you just all the cables are in there blah 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 but my wife sometimes is on call, right? So she's a physician as well, and so we do make exceptions. If you're on call, she's, she has her phone by her bedside. I mean, it's just part of her job, unfortunately. 
Um, but there are ways to get around that too. Like there are just normal phones too, you know, that you can have by your bedside. <laughs> remember, that? remember norm phones. What's that? Like it doesn't have to be your message smartphone buzzing notifying thing. It can just be a regular phone. We still have a landline. Um, actually, it's not even technically a landline. It's like a, it's it's a wireless landline type phone from Rogers. But you know, put, put that by the bed and, that, and use that for calls that come through at night if you can arrange for your work to call that number or your home number. So it doesn't have to be your smartphone, which is kind of buzzing at all hours and notifying and whatever. And has you know, I, I think the principle is you just don't want the last thing to be your phone and the first thing in the morning to be your phone. Like, I found it's funny, like I get up now, I just get up and I brush my teeth and I go downstairs and I, I don't get to my phone until about 10 minutes later to see if anybody's called me or whatever. I've made my coffee, I've had, made my cereal, my banana and I'm eating. It's like, oh yeah, maybe I should just see what's happening. I read the newspaper and I check CBC News and that's how I start my day. But it's that 20 minutes or so before that that feels so much more stress-free. And I, it used to be, like a couple years ago, it was like, oh, you know, wake up, it's like, what's going on? Uh, okay, you know, bright light. Uh. So but that, that's, that's gone now, and it's, it, it has, has definitely reduced the kind of anxiety I might feel in the morning, first thing in the morning when I'm waking up, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, and you can wake to music, you know, and it's like, or you can, you know, people are not waking up to the eh, 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 eh anymore. You can eliminate that. You can get a good alarm clock. Buy your kids a good alarm clock and yeah. they'll appreciate it. Yeah, the, the, the comment was the best thing they did for their kids was to buy them alarm clocks. Mm -hmm. And so uh, give that a go. I know my dad put one in the farthest point of my room to get me up, but... <laughs> They worked, I guess. And watches too. Watch the yeah. same thing. Watch like you put a watch on. Like you'd be surprised how many times people pick up their phone to check the time. And they realize, oh, there's a notification, and then suddenly you're five minutes into like checking your messages. So they found that just getting a watch reduces the amount of time that you pick up your phone. I don't actually have a watch. I, I should. That should be the next thing I do. But you know, there's always room for improvement. <laughs> I no think somebody perfect. had one question back there. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, there. Yeah, so uh, most of our research on internet addiction comes from Korea, and because the um, amount of technology used there is actually probably the worst, in, highest in the world, which is probably the worst in the world. So, but it's the highest in the world is in Asia, and so, and I'm not, I know that's where internet addiction was first recognized. Um, there was literally like, like, young adults and teenagers who were 24/7 like you know, like we might see at Casino Rama, like people on slot machines, they were just on their phones, uh, not on their phones, but uh, playing video games at these video arcades uh, almost continuously. And so that's where most of our studies and case studies have come from. So, so you're probably right, there probably does exist something there. 
I'm not aware right now of any sort of formal program that helps kids deal with, like right now there's only a, an official diagnosis of, of um, uh, internet uh, gaming addiction, I think is what it's called. That's the actual DSM-5 classification. But there's many other forms of digital addiction out there, which, you know, it's more than just video games. We see, for example, social media, incessant social media checking, pornography is the other one. So there are definitely other forms of digital addiction that I think are, hopefully will be recognized soon as being actual real disorders that we may need to develop some programs for, some actually standardized, evidence-based programs. So we may see that, or maybe we won't need to. Maybe we'll smarten up before that and, and things will change in other ways. But who knows, there's always hope. Okay. Uh, we, we have time for, I think, two more. Uh, this one here, I, I've kind of summarized a couple of the online ones. Or I guess people are maybe wondering if, if they feel that they're, maybe their children are addicted, even though there's maybe not an official designation for that, other than the gimming one you mentioned. What, what steps can parents take uh, if they feel maybe their child is there or, um, you know, or a family member? Um, how can they move forward? Or, or what are some first steps, do you think, that families could do? Yeah, like like if you really think that your 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 child is addicted and your your they it's taken over their life or at least a significant part of it, you know, first of all, just check yourself just to make sure. Like, okay, you know, is is this is this is this real or is it is it just look like it or are they actually doing their homework or whatever? Just like it's tough to start to step in and sound definitive when all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, maybe it's not really like they're addicted. But let's say you are concerned that they are really, um, that it's too much. You got to talk to them about it and you got to like work collaboratively with them. If you think that you're just going to say, okay, boom, like technology fast for the next month, um, I think you might face some real like permanent backlash. <laughs> so. I think you want to just do like stepwise approach and just say, listen, like, what do you think about your technology use and use a, use a collaborative approach. And it's going to be hard because you might get a lot of pushback even on that already. You know, we know that addressing any sort of addiction is going to like get people's backs up and when you, when you, when you bring it out. And that's why we have interventions and things like that. So um, I, I, I think you want to do it gradually and carefully and collaboratively, um, you know, to, to, to not just like boot camps and like dramatic approaches tend not to work, at least not long term. So I think you want to just be very intentional about it and, and gradual. And then just be like understanding. I mean, the kids don't choose that route. It's like not like they, it, 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 just, it just sort of, I think it becomes a, a gravitational pull to that direction and you know what else can they fill their time with like so offer them other opportunities really try and be positive about it as opposed to just punitive about it because that is more plan a i think you want to try and be more plan b when you're addressing that it's not easy it's not easy and any, any sort of excessive use i mean especially if it's long term I always say anything that took a long time to get there is going to take a long time to like unget there. And so, you know, just, just be very careful that you make sure that you know what you're dealing with. Get professional help. Uh, if the child's willing, that's the other question, but you may need to talk to a therapist and say like, you know, maybe we're, maybe there's other issues here that we're not, uh, that we're not seeing. Well, I, I, we could do more questions. There were some more great online questions. I'm sure you have some as well, but we wanted to be done by eight, so I think we'll we'll wrap up there. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeah. Meter. And, uh, and and if you want to go through them, I'm wondering, would it, it might be possible, you can think this through before you give me an answer now, maybe we can make your notes available and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. for a download, and then they could have them, yeah. and we'll email it out to you. If you registered, we'll email those out to you after the event. And uh, what I'll do is I'll make you generate a PDF of yeah, the presentation, if, and if you can willing, just yeah. do with it whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. So we'll get that out to you too. And uh, don't forget, uh, again, just kind of bringing it back to what's going on at Faith. Go to faithmuskoka.ca slash Christmas to see what's coming up and with some opportunities for your families uh, that exist here at the church. Uh, let's close in prayer. And uh, thank you for joining us here and online. It's been great. Let's pray. 
Dear God, thanks for uh, this time together. Thank you for an opportunity to learn about technology and some strategies to navigate through these things and, and uh, issues as a family. I pray that you give us the courage the, and, the, um, and, the, and the will to do it as we lead and guide our families. As this, I ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody.